Bill. So, got it. We are recording. Um, so, thrilled to be able to, to talk to you guys. It's always great to talk to people who work who do this kind of work in, in other parts of the country. Um, and I know we've only got a half an hour, so I'll get into it. I try not to slog you down with too many uh, technical details about the program. But my name is Bill Darling. I'm the director uh, of Assistive Technology of Ohio, which is Ohio's uh, tech agency. I've been here, uh, Eric and Gay and I have all been here since 1990. And um, just thrilled to tell you about a little program that we kind of stumbled into about five years ago. And that is our, uh, our school telepresence robot program. And we, it, we informally refer to this program as Jacob's Robots. And that's because the first kid that we had we used a robot for us was a, a young young man by the name of Jacob Calderman. And so um, it's been a neat thing to, it, it's not a huge program, it never has been. And I'm glad for that, considering the type of situation that has to be present really for a, a telepresence robot to be the right call. Um, but it is, it's a neat thing to be able to, to bring uh, this technology into their lives, especially for some of these kids that are going through incredibly challenging uh, period. So. Um, the first thing I want to do is recognize our partners. Um, we've had two wonderful partners in this program, both children's hospitals. Uh, Nationwide Children's is, is what they call the hospital in Columbus, uh, one of the leading children's hospitals in the country. And we've also had a wonderful relationship with the Children's Hospital in Dayton, uh, which is about an hour and a half from here. So um, these three entities working together, it's been kind of a neat thing to be able to bring these technology into the lives of kids. So, okay, so the first thing you do, meet Jacob. I'll tell you just a little bit because as a way to get this started, uh, good news, Jacob's, Jacob's doing very well. He's a sophomore in high school. We, you know, not every story that we work with in this program has, has, has had a happy ending, but um, Jacob is a kid that I've known since he was in kindergarten. And it's a funny how all these things, so many things in life start locally. They just start with something that happens in your own life. Um, Jacob was a classmate of my daughter, Mary, um, in fourth grade, and they were in Mr. Wojciechowski's class together at Worthington Estates Elementary, just down the road from my house. Um, halfway through that year, Jacob just started having medical problems that nobody could understand. He went shopping with his mom uh, at a Walmart around Christmas time, collapsed, uh, nearly died. Uh, they, he was, it was an incredibly scary situation. He couldn't breathe. Um, they had no idea what was going on and they were able to keep him alive and get him to the hospital and they kept checking him out and what they figured out was that his lungs collapsed on him for no reason. I mean, this kid was not involved in a contact sports or an accident or abuse or anything. And it just doesn't happen that a healthy kid has lungs collapse on him, but his kept collapsing on him. It was a very dangerous situation. Um, and so they, they made a lot of uh, recommendations for Jacob, the first of which is they shouldn't go to school because school is a place that kids go to get a cold and a, a cough and, you know, the flu and all this stuff and all that could have been incredibly dangerous for Jacob at that time. So he was the first kid I ever knew that had to go to school. He stayed at home. He was not allowed to have anyone come home with him. Um, he had no friends over. He couldn't go anywhere but to his own, to the doctor's office, the hospital, and to uh, his grandparents' house were the only things. And so he um, was, to be honest, my, my daughter kept talking about Jacob and, and you know, we saw Jacob today, we waved to him in the car and all this stuff. I didn't think Jacob was gonna be around all that long. I thought it was a very sad situation. I didn't realize he was still going to school. I didn't realize he was having tutors come in. I didn't realize he was going to school online. So we had a couple of these robots, these telepresence robots that we had bought they were just sitting here collecting dust, waiting for some someone to come along with a reason to use it. Jacob, I finally figured out that Jacob might be our first robot case. And so I, I contacted the principal and we got Jacob and his family set up with a telepresence robot. Um, I would, hopefully this will work. I don't, know if it, I, I don't know if I need to share a different screen. Can you guys see that at all? Or are you seeing that? Do you guys see a video right now? No, we do not. Okay. Hold on. An awesome journey so far. Jacob is an amazing student. 
Let me, let me check, pick a different Where's, where's Jacob? It's a three minute video. Hopefully, you can hear it. Yes, we can. My daughter. Yeah. Um, because he's sick, all of the students really care about Jacob and they want the best for him and they worry about him. And she would come home and talk about how there's a kid here who everyone missed. But this one student just kept talking about it at home and that made it happen. I was just talking about it. I didn't know he could do anything about it. And so I, I'm going to tear up because it's just so special. At our AP down at Ohio State, we, in the fall, we obtained a couple of, of these devices, and I never really put it all together. But the more she told me about the case that's going on here in the school, I said, I think I might have something. Uh, essentially, this is FaceTime. So it's like he's in school. Mm -hmm. um, the difference is, is he can actually move around. He doesn't have yeah. to stand in one place. Jacob, yeah, yeah. That's the same kind of technology that segues if you don't write. The only passenger is the iPad. You can control that robot from anywhere in the world. It's kind of weird at first, but then I progressed on and knew how to control it. I was so excited. And the first day, he rolled up, and I got to you know, say hi and hug him around the little robot. It was so much fun. With home tutor, you know, we'd have the tutor come out several days a week for a couple hours. And I mean, he likes to dunk me around. I mean, it was someone new in the house who so didn't have anybody in. But it still wasn't me around his friends. It still wasn't, you know, being able to talk with his teachers. And it just was something was missing. I think having control on when to get in there and when to go, you know, when to talk, and he was just saying things he needs in school, raise his hand, things like that, is something he really enjoys having. So, and he's mentioned it before. So. Well, going to school for a kid is so much more than just the books and learning and everything and the information. It's so much of it is the social interaction. Go there to meet friends. It's something that these kids go through together. Jacob was removed from that. The great part about the double robot is that it, is, it allows you that interactive ability that you can listen in and see what's going on. And that you can you know, turn and, and move around and, and actually be engaged in the classroom just like anyone else. It's nice to see them in the same morning time because, no, I didn't like so much. The fact that I'm taking up. All right, let me see if I can get back to the right page then. Uh, one thing I, I say, I tell people about this, this program, you know, we've been here at Ohio State since the mid 90s. Uh, I've been here since 2000. We've been helping people for 20 years. We never got any media coverage until we put a robot in Jacob's classroom. Then the Columbus Dispatch couldn't get enough of it. It was on every television station in Columbus. And, um, and so it, it, I mean, part of that is due to just that he's just an adorable kid. And he, he used our robot for a year and a half, uh, a couple different times, a couple different types of robots. Um, and then I think starting starting sixth, seventh grade, he was able to pretty much go without it. There were a couple of times we had to come in and for a couple of weeks, a cold and flu season, substitute in a robot for him. But now he's a sophomore in high school, goes to a different high school, uh, doing great. So um, it was a real, it was a real wonderful start to the program. The parents uh, swear, it is the interesting thing about because we had no idea what the impact of this program was going to be. And the impact on Jacob educationally was nothing. Uh, he, he was a whip and he was getting A's, going online and having tutors. Um, it certainly didn't do anything for him medically, except his parents swear that this kept him normal. Um, he felt so alone. He was home all by himself. He was the kid that was too sick to go to school. And all of a sudden he's the coolest kid in the school overnight. Um, and he's in his classroom every day with his friends, and he was still part of Worthington Estates. He was still part of Mr. Wojo's fourth grade class, and um, so it was. It they think that helped him because the important thing for him was just to keep growing and getting stronger, and every day was a win. And they think that this helped in that way. 
So kind of a neat way to start our program. Um, the next, our next step was, well, there aren't a lot of Jacobs out there, thankfully. Um, but we, so we wondered who else could benefit from a telepresence robot. And that's when we started reaching out to Children's Hospital and they came up with the idea of kids who had cancer. And there's no ideal case in this situation at all. But one of the reasons it, it could be a benefit to a kid with a cancer diagnosis is because in a good situation, when things are going well medically for them, um, you, know, you get a diagnosis of cancer, you have to go through chemotherapy, radiation, which knocks your immune system down to zero. Um, and then you build back up. And when you get back to about 100%, then they send you back in for another round of chemo and radiation. So they usually go through that about three times on a typical case, and that's about a semester. So um, it, they were gonna be out for a, a period of time. It was a very scary time, and it was really helpful to be able to uh, have a robot put in their classroom so you could they could check in every day. Um, one of the big hurdles was getting Children's Hospital here in Columbus to sign off on it because you're gonna have a live stream coming from the hospital. But I think they just uh, realized that kids FaceTime, they do all this stuff. Um, and if he's in his room or she's in her room, um, you're not really risking anything. There's no HIPAA information that's gonna be flying out that's gonna mean anything to anybody. So when we got them to sign off on it that, they, that a kid could do it from Children's Hospital, when they're in there for treatment, then the, then the program really took off and we had a partner we could work with and, and we've been able to reach out to kids all over the state of Ohio because of that. Real quickly, the four types of robots that we have, um, and we have somewhere in the, I think 17 robots, something like that. Um, we have, our first was the double robot, which you saw in the video from Double Robotics. We have beam robots, which is a story in itself. I, um, it was invention, uh, I think it was Enhanced Technologies. I don't know if I actually wrote that down right. It's it's a it's a new uh, company now, Blue Ocean Robotics or something out of Denmark. That company's been bought and sold a couple times. Uh, we have two Omni robots, which is uh, an interesting robot from uh, a startup company out in um, in California, and we just bought two Vigo robots, our, la our latest edition um, from a company called Vecna Technologies. Um, so I'm going to go through all those real quick, and you know you can get into the uh, the weeds about why one works and one doesn't. I'm not, um, you know, I'm not really able to talk to you, but it, it was fascinating because sometimes one works and the other doesn't. This is a quick look at the double robot app. I mean, the way all these basically work is the kid is home with a phone or an iPad or on their computer, and they have either go to the website or they have the app from the company. In this case, double is. The, provides the app. On the double robot, the one that you saw in the video, it actually ha it uses a iPad as the computer for the robot. And so the kids at home, we would, in a lot of cases, give the kid an iPad to use. Um, and they have, the, they have the same app. One is in driver mode and one is in robot mode. And they both log in under the same username and password. And when they do that, they would see that there's a robot waiting for them in Lima, Ohio, with the name of the robot that, that, that they have. And they click on that and all of a sudden, poof, they're in the classroom um, and they can see everything and they can hear everything that's going on in there. They're connected over the internet. You have to have, uh, both sides have to be on Wi-Fi. Um, and that can be challenging in the home. It's not usually as much of a challenge in the school, but you have to, have, both sides have to be on Wi-Fi. And so they're basically FaceTiming uh, from home or from the, from the hospital, seeing what's going on, hearing what's going on through an app that also has the, the ability to act as a remote control device for the robot itself. And so it, it, it's, it, I don't have a screen that shows the movability functions for the, for the double, but you know, up is, is uh, forward, down is backward. It can go left and right. The double itself can get taller or shorter if you want to at, at, let the teacher know you're asking a question and things like that. Um, one of the things about the double is that it's the double robot itself is a Bluetooth device and it's connected to the to the iPad that is connected to the robot. So um, they those two have to be connected to work. And so what you're doing is you're shooting information through the app over the internet, and then the the, the iPad is shooting the information down to the robot by Bluetooth, and then the robot moves. So um, it's cool. It can, you know it can move, turn around, and 
and look who's asking a question. It can move around the classroom. It can move, you know, hopefully uh, it can move down the hall and go down to your next class if that's something that you need to do for me, perhaps for older kids that have, have to move around a schoolroom more often during the day. Um, so that's kind of the basic, that's the way the double works. And in a sense, that's a way a, a, lot, of the, a lot of them work. Uh, that's a picture of the double. The assets of using a double, we have the most ones that we have are doubles. Um, when it used an iPad and the, the double two used an iPad, the, the, the newest iteration, which is right over my shoulder, that doesn't use an iPad anymore. One of the biggest assets of using uh, a double was that it used an iPad, which uh, is because when you go into, no matter where you go to a museum or a presentation, a conference center or school, if you try to log a wife, uh, an iPad onto the system, it's going to accept it. Um, it's going to, yeah, oh yeah, that's an iPad. It doesn't care that it's a robot, it's an iPad. And they accept it and you're in. Um, that is not the case with some of the other robots that we've had. We had challenges get the, getting them on school Wi-Fi's. You know, as you see, it's kind of a segue. If you've seen segways, I'm sure you have it at parks and things like that. Um, so it moves around very well. It has a stabilizing feature. I, I, this is our best athlete is what I, what I, the way I describe it. Um, and one of the reasons that we used double was because compared to the other robots, this one just had a fee. We just bought the robot and we didn't have to worry about an annual fee. Um, some of them were, you know, a couple hundred dollars per robot per year, which didn't bother me. The, the, the fee itself doesn't bother me. But when you, if you guys work in the tech X, you know, you, sometimes at Ohio State, it's very difficult to go <clears throat> to uh, go. You're going year to year on fiscal years and matching those up with subscriptions is kind of can be a challenge with our, our purchasing department. So we reached out to Double first because they didn't have an annual fee. Um, the negatives of using a Double, it, which is kind of weird, but the negative is that it uses an iPad. Uh, it's also a positive, it makes it very easy, but it's an iPad is not built to be the computer system for a double robot. It's built to be this thing that can do hundreds of things. Um, one of the big challenges with using doubles is that there's a lot of apps on an iPad and it just kept asking, it keeps asking for, hey, can you type in your Apple ID today? Uh, we need to update this. We need, we need to update your, you know, the, the, the operating system. And the teachers don't really need to be dealing with that, but you, you can't avoid it too much if you're using um, an iPad. So that's kind of, it's, it's a positive and a negative. This is prone to falling, um, especially if the Bluetooth signal goes out, it just falls. And if it falls, things just go flying off of it because it's built it with an understanding that it's going to fall. So the camera flies off and things, you know, th things like that. It scares you, but it's easy to put it back together and, and, and have it um, come back and start working again. But it is a 25 pound robot and something like that falling in a kindergarten classroom is not something that is, is a great selling point. But um, that's the one we've used the most. Um, and this is what the newest iteration looks like where they've gotten rid of the iPad. And unfortunately with this one, if it falls, there's nothing, it's not really built to withstand it. It's so it, the first one we tried it with, it fell and shattered. Um, so we're still, we're getting that one fixed, but, um, so I'm not really sold on the new iteration. I keep using the double two that has the iPad. This is, um, beam. And this is what they look like now. It's called a Gobi robot now. So beam is, a, is an outdated term. Um, this is my, when I get this, when I get a beam up and running and in a school and them set up, that's the best robot I have. Um, this is the only robot that I've had where you set it up in a school and we'll see in May. I mean, they just, I, I've literally never gotten a call about a beam robot once it's up and established and running. Um, the problem with a beam robot um, is that it is the, you know, the company for some reasons was having all kinds of problems and like, I couldn't get any kind of help. Like they started sending me emails and it, you could just tell from the email, this company's going out of business. It's going into, you know, foreclosure or whatever it is. Um, they just had no ability to help you if anything went wrong, which didn't happen a lot. But um, so I stopped having confidence in this, in the beam, just because of that. And it went through a couple of different companies. I just have been talking to the guy from Blue Ocean um, um, and bought one, but the cost now has gone up to from what was about $6,000 to $11,000. So we're 
very soon, if Ohio State can make it go through, we're going to have one of these new kinds, and we'll be sending that one out. Um, that's the Cadillac. That's the best one. But aren't, and you'll see this in this field of of telepresence robots that the companies behind them may not be able to help you as much as you would like. Uh, the 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 technology is fantastic, but the support may not be there, and that's been the case with it. Um, there's just the assets of the beam. I, I basically the two were is that it, I didn't have any problems with it once you got set up. The other thing about the beam was that it was incredibly easy to control it. We have all of our beams under one account. We can say, you know, Mrs. Johnson has control of this beam from, you know, or Joey has control of the beam from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday from from September to, you know, the last week of May, and you're done. I mean, they just they they. It, it's a lot more of a challenge with the double, um, but the administrative function for the ask for the beam was was a real is a real selling point. Um, one of the ne negatives of it is that it's the heaviest robot we have by far. Uh, it doesn't fall. It, it it really doesn't. You'd have to knock it over, but if you knock it over, it could hurt. I mean, forty five pounds is a lot um, in in a kindergarten classroom. So if something went wrong, that most of the weight's in the base, but a forty five pound robot in a classroom can be can make people a little bit nervous um, and one of the problems with the beam and with the others that I'll show you here in a second is that I didn't I had sometimes had trouble getting it on the school wi-fi because it just didn't recognize it it didn't know what this was and that's what uh, something I had with the other ones this is uh, we have two of these uh, we've had pretty good success with the Omni telepresence robots to come a startup company out of San Jose uh, it's twenty seven hundred dollars. It's basically an Android tablet on with a, with a speaker halfway up. Um, the thing that's kind of cool about it and a problem for Ohio State is that when you buy when you buy an Omni telepresence robot, it doesn't exist um, and, until you pay for it, and then they three D print it, and now now it exists. So and and that's not the, really the way Ohio State does business. They usually tend to wait for the technology to come in before they'll pay you. So we had to do a little back and forth on that, but. Um, it's great. It's worked out great. It's worked in some situations where nothing else would work. Um, the Android function of it has been good. The problem with it is that it's an incredibly small company and they have very, very limited ability to get on the phone and help you if you're needed in troubleshoot. So um, I'm going to get quickly get to the last one. And this is the Vigo, which some of you may be uh, you know, familiar with. It's been around the longest from Vecna Technologies out in Massachusetts. I think it's a great robot. Um, I, I know that they're coming out with a new iteration soon. It might it probably going to have a bigger screen, um, but it's it's a fantastic piece of equipment. The, the movable cameras is great. Um, the one we just purchased was about sixty five hundred dollars. The thing that I love most about the Vigo is that it's from a company that has that's in telehealth. It's in a company that's in ro builds robots that deliver things that have nothing to do with this. So it, it's a it's a thriving company that has a lot of, they have a support function there that the other companies don't seem to have. You can get somebody on the phone and they'll, they'll talk to you about what's going on with your robot. So I, I really like that about, about the Vigo. Um, again, the, the, the liabilities, one of the liabilities has got a very small screen. I think that's gonna be addressed with the new iteration of a Vigo that's gonna be coming out in the next several months, I think. Um, the way it would, the way the system would work basically is that for us, one of our partners would identify a kid, talk to the family about, would you like to have a robot placed in your school? Um, that really helps us. It, if the, uh, if Children's Hospital reaches out to the school, then they know we're not, we're not like calling it, what is this about a robot? They're not trying to sell us anything. It sounds like a really cool idea. So they kind of call the school for us, then we follow up with the school and we set up an initial meeting with everyone who's going to be affected by this and the student if possible um you know the teacher the it person how do we get it on the school wi-fi what are the issues what can go wrong with this unit it's an incredibly important uh, meeting to have uh, so that everybody knows what it is and has a chance to to try it out the funniest part is that the, the training for everybody might take 45 minutes to an hour except the student the student takes about 30 seconds when you get a kid on um, when he all of a sudden it's moving and he realizes that he, he or she's in charge of it, they stop listing and they just start having fun with the robot and they figure all the other stuff out later. But the parents have all kinds of questions. The kids have none. So 
um, the issues that we've run into, the, um, sometimes you have an issue, does the, does the family have Wi-Fi at all or the quality of their Wi-Fi? You can get around that sometimes with a hotspot if they have, uh, a, you know, if they have cell phones and a data plan and all that stuff, you can plug in a hotspot there. Um, there's, there's like things you buy that are like hockey pucks and all they are are hotspots. And so they have Wi-Fi in the home for that purpose. The quality of the Wi-Fi in the school is a huge problem. Schools were built before, many of them were built before the internet. And when they put in the internet, they certainly weren't thinking of telepresence robots roaming the school. So um, that's a challenge and it can be a challenge that's too difficult to overcome. If you don't have quality Wi-Fi throughout the school, you know, if the, if the robot can't move throughout the school, then you really don't need a robot. So that has been a challenge for us. Um, you gotta make sure it's charged every night. Does the company offer uh, uh, technical support? And one of the things we've needed in every situation that has almost naturally occurred is that there need to be angels. We call them angels and just people to look out for the robot. Generally, it's going to be the best friends of the, of the kid that's sick. Uh, we had a, case, a sad case up in Northwest uh, Ohio, but um, her two best friends would come every day and go to where the robot was. And then she would, um, Allie would, 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 log in and they would walk to class together, um, make sure that the robot alley got to where she needed to get. So, and then you have, all, uh, you have some issues with the schools on confidentiality. Um, the fact that a, a live stream is going into the home. Uh, one school was even concerned about the live stream coming in from the home. I, I don't know what their concern was, but that can be, you know, an issue for some parents. If one, why does one family get to see what's going on in the classroom when the others don't? So that's, those are some of the things we've had to work through. Um, and that's basically the end of my presentation. That, that, that's our information there. You can go to our website to learn a little bit more about the program, but I'd be happy to talk to anybody. If they wanted to know a little more about this, you can give me a call sometime and we have more time and I, I'll, I'll go through with anybody. But if you guys have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Hi, my name is Jen. I'm out in Berkeley and I did have a few questions. Um, let me, I had put them in the chat, so let me go find them. I didn't see the chat, I'm sorry. No worries, I, you were presenting. I know how that goes. Yeah. Um, so oh, there's but, 14 chats. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, let, me, let me find them. So um, I was curious first um, with the hospital scenarios, how, the hospitals, uh, were there any issues coordinating medical staff visiting the patients in their rooms uh, with HIPAA? Well, I mean, originally one of the things we had considered was that we were going to uh, use it for like kids getting uh, dialysis, right? So they're right in there getting treatment. Um, and that was gonna be a real concern for HIPAA because stuff's going on around them and they could see the images of other people that are receiving services. I think what the children's services realizes, you know, they, okay, they can only be on this when they're in their, in their hotel. I mean, they're in the hospital. So um, right. I just think that they were comfortable enough with the idea that, you know, there's not really nothing, they're going to, they'll be on the screen, but nothing else is going to make sense to anybody. And so that they, you know, I, I think if active treatment's going on, they probably aren't, you know, they don't, if, if the kid doesn't feel well enough, he's not going to school. And so it was just a situation where you were able to allow, they were, the, 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 the hospital was comfortable enough with the kid basically FaceTiming this robot uh, from, the, from the hospital. And that was a, you know, a big day for us when they did that. So. All right. So like, even if nurses were coming in and taking vitals and things like that, they- Yeah, I mean, okay. it's not a problem. You can mute your end of it and you can turn off the camera on some of them or just cover the camera. So if you don't want to be seen or you don't want anybody hearing what's going on where you're at, you have the ability to shut that down. Right. And so um, uh, you, I think already addressed this broadband in both locations really impacts the transmission and uh, somebody else uh, asked about response lag in the transmission. It's a problem. Uh, it's a problem. If, if the, one of the things you'll see, uh, it's not good if a robot is moving through a hall. First of all, when the robot gets there, it's the biggest thing in school. And so kids are running up to it and, and they're putting their face in front of it. And if you have a one or two second lag, it's not good because what you're seeing is not what's there. And so um, 
that's a challenge. And, and sometimes schools have gotten around that by having having the robot leave the class a few minutes early so it can get where it's going. But in general, you know, you you have to have very little lag in order for for this to be something that would work. You know, I've never I've never really heard of a problem, but I, I've seen it um, in schools where they ultimately decided not to use one. That was one of the reasons because of the lag. So. Got it. And do you, how long does it take for it to not become the disruptive shiny toy? A couple of weeks. Okay. I mean, it's, ama it's amazing what kids can get used to um, when everyone's had a chance to talk to them on it or her on it. Um, we just show up and I, I've had to go to schools and say, I need to work on the robot. Where's Jacob's robot? Where's Jacob? He's, he's down at the library. I mean, they just start, they get used to it. Um, in a relatively relative, I mean, it's not okay. Uh, it, it, any type of new shiny toy and any type of technology, kids will eventually get used to it and they just accepted it. And it was never, it, it becomes uh, almost a natural part of the school after a little while. Do you have any like pat presentations or verbiage that you use um, to introduce one to help uh, speed that acclimation process? I do not. I've never, uh, I've, you know, I've, you, I just had the, the understanding that it's gonna the school's gonna be nuts for a couple of days. Um, the teachers, I mean, they be some, a lot of times they never see anything like this. But um, you know, I don't have a, a presentation for that. Um, that's I never thought of that, and that's probably a good idea. But it, you know, I, I think that they understand that it's going to be an adjustment for the for the kids in the school. But every school's been able to make that adjustment. I've ne you know, I've never seen that part. That the idea that it's so exciting ultimately has never, it's never maintained to the point where it's ever a problem with one of our cases. And similarly, do you have any like verbiage and or forms about confidentiality to help ease that uh, tension? Um, we don't have a form. Basically, every school has come, that's been an issue for every school, and they've handled it differently. Um, the, the schools will say, some schools will just let the parents, they'll send a note home with the kids, say, hey, we're going to have a robot in our classroom. Some of them have sought the sign off of every parent in the classroom. And one, one school, the guy felt the need to try to get the sign off of everyone in the school. I assured him there's no way that you're going to go 400 for 400, and they didn't. One, one family had a problem with it. And so that really kind of put a monkey wrench in how they could use the robot. But we don't have a standard boilerplate like uh, document that can get a, you know, immunize a school from any liability. That's kind of, we've just, uh, you know, we, we, one of our selling points to them is if it's good enough for children's hospital, you know, it should be okay to have it, you know, Worthington Estates. So, um, and, and that's been a message that's resonated, but yet generally, that stuff has been handled at the school level. Yeah, I'm sure having that cachet of a hospital willing to use it has been incredibly helpful for you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Those were all my questions. All right. Anyone else? I have three new messages and I missed those. Uh, a funding. Um, how did you how did you market the program and get the referrals? Okay, that's a great question. Um, the uh, one of the things we did was we we just sent a, a, a postcard or a letter to every school district, every superintendent um, and say, hey, we got a new program. And it was amazing because one of the, the, the responses that we got about this program were almost all from small school districts where the superintendent's in the same building as every student. And um, but we have done it mostly through this you know, archaic technology known as the U.S. mail service, where we just, we send out our little stories and every couple times a year, we've sent out a 600 piece mailer because we've got over 600 school districts. And so that's the main way that we've marketed it. We market it the same way we mark our, our other, uh, through our website and when we present and all that stuff. But this has been one program we have actually um, been able to, to market through the mail and had tremendous success doing that. The funding, um, the, the way we have a fee on this, we have an $80 a month fee and we don't like charging it, but we also didn't want to, when we started, we had like three robots. So we didn't want to, we wanted to make sure it got used by kids that really needed it. And if it was just free, 
um, then we would we were worried that schools would say, oh, well, sure, we'll sign up for one. That's no problem. Um, but so we have a fee associated with it. For a while, we were uh, Nationwide Children's was paying us a monthly fee. Um, but what we have generally tried to do is not charge. Um, we have a, a, a wonderful foundation, a charity down in the Miami Valley, the Dayton area, that is, has kind of underwritten the cost for the program for all for all the Montgomery County and surrounding counties down by Dayton. So they, nobody has to pay for that. Um, if necessary, Children's Hospital would cover the costs for it if it's a Children's Hospital case. Um, and, but you know, they're only going to have it for a couple of months. And so um, if it's a situation where they may have to have it for years, um, we, we, which is possible on a couple of cases, we may have to look at something else. But in general, we, it's, it's a weird way to say it. We have a fee associated with it that we tried very, very hard not to not to uh, charge people for. So. Anyone else? Okay, what? Um, the Omni, since I only need that access. Yeah. The 3D printing. Uh, you know, I don't know if the 3D printing was a selling point. Uh, for me, I was kind of stunned when, when I found that out. It's, it, the, the, the bad part about the 3D printing was that it, it makes it take about a month to get your robot. Um, so if you need one now, uh, if you need one within the next week, an Omni is probably not the best way to go because the one you're buying doesn't exist. And so that, but other than that, if you can wait a month, yeah, but we had an Omni that worked in a school in Lima. Nothing else worked. We took an Omni. It was a, it was a long shot that I, nothing else has worked. So I don't see why an Omni would, and it just worked like a charm. It was great. So um, I'm sure there's a reason if you look, you want to talk to some IT people about why one robot works in a certain situation, I, but I'm not the guy to answer those questions. So. Anything else? We do you have another question? Um, has the robot been used for college students? Uh, not so much. Um, not so much. We, we, you know, a college student, uh, you know, I'm, I'm at Ohio State, so it's a haul from one class to another. Um, you don't need a robot, really, if you're just going to be in one class. And um, the robot has to be somewhere where you're on Wi-Fi all the time. And so it doesn't really work for college students going across the campus, going across the quads, things like that. Um, and it, it tends to work best with younger kids in schools that don't, you know, high, a lot of high schools have, you're moving all day long, you have a different class to go to every hour. You may have multiple levels in the school. They have elevators and things like that. So um, older kids have been a challenge, but uh, younger kids in elementary schools have been the people that, that have had the fewest challenges and that have worked out the best for. I had one more connectivity question. Have you ever just uh, attached a hotspot to the robot itself? Yeah, I mean, what we've done, you know, you can use your phone as a hotspot. Um, and so we've had families that went out and bought a phone and just put the, <laughs> attached the phone to the, to the uh, uh, robot. And so the, the, then it would, it would, if the school had connectivity issues, it would just eliminate that. So we, we've done that. Um, but the, as far as in the home, we just, the one case that we've done that it's still ongoing, we just went out and bought a, a Verizon, I think it was that we bought a hockey puck or whatever that could serve and they, they've been using that as their hotspot. So, but yeah, you can, you can attach one to the robot, but the easiest way to do that is with a phone. Any other questions? Please feel free to turn on your mics. Well, I'm a, I'm available, guys. If you want to, uh, there's one new message to see. Uh, oh, license. yeah. Well, Jacob was a success story. Um, you know, the, the the best success. We've had a lot of success stories. Um, we, but the, the way that a success story for us is that they we we install this robot. The kid goes through one semester of um, of chemotherapy. And then we go get the robot and we take the robot out of the school to absolutely no fanfare. 
you know, it was huge when it, uh, when it showed up and we'll just walk it out silently. And, and um, you know, we've had a lot of those cases where, you know, it's funny, they said, would, would you like to come see Mr. Darling and, you know, say goodbye to the robot? And no, <laughs> they're just happy to be on with their life. Um, so the, 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 it's weird, our, our biggest success stories are quiet. And, you know, we've had of the about 30 kids that we've had use a robot, we've lost five uh, to cancer. So uh, we've had some real sad stories there, but the parents have always, and the school has always made a point to let us know you know what the what, what role the, the the robot played that it, it was such a big part of their life to to have had to take in that journey alone um would have been just more devastating and not giving them as much of a chance and so they've been very grateful for that so even the ones that you know that the medical issues were just too profound we think we've had a positive impact in their lives um even though it didn't have the ending that we were all looking for so uh, funny thing is that the, the, the success stories end very quietly and it's a great day for the school and it's a great day for the parents and for us just to go get that ro robot and put it back in our car and quietly drive off and they go on with their life. This has been really, really great. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. I love talking about this program. These are, it's great to work with kids. We don't, we don't have, we don't do a ton with kids, but this is one program that we do. And we're very fortunate to be able to offer the program. We think that it, you know, any chance we get to tell other tech, assistive technology folks about it, because I think it's a program that can work in any state. Um, yes. And so, so thanks for this opportunity. We really appreciate the chance to, to spend this time with you. Thank you.